When we think of fertilizers, we think of how they are absolutely needed for farming. They contain some very important macronutrients which help farmers achieve great crop yields, but this pretty much is an oversimplification. Recent studies have proven that the excessive use of fertilizers is causing a disruption of our biosphere. Since agriculture is that one field requiring fertilizers use, it's time we reevaluated how we can sustain the industry by reducing fertilizer dependence, so let's get into it. First up is is there a need for agricultural sustenance without fertilizers? To put it very simply, we've got substantial evidence proving that excessive fertilizer use contributions to pollution as well as greenhouse gas emissions. Both plant and livestock production require immense quantities of nitrogen-based fertilizers. And because of this, we can conclude that the main drivers of the nitrogen cycle are our agricultural activities. Shockingly, not all of the nitrogen supplied to plants is used up by them. A significant amount is lost through leaching, soil erosion, and gaseous emissions. All of the excess nitrogen in our atmosphere is causing not just soil pollution, but air pollution as well. And that's not where the side effects end. All the pollution in our watersheds and coastal marine waters is due to the extra nitrogen. It still doesn't stop here. One of the main contributors to biodiversity loss is, once again, nitrogen. In a way, we've got fertilizer use indirectly driving climate change. And if we want to make agriculture more sustainable, we need to find a way to decrease our dependence on fertilizers. We need to look for alternatives. One innovative approach that's being studied by scientists is called ecological intensification. That's a big phrase, but don't worry, we'll explain it all to you. Moving on, precisely what do we mean by ecological intensification? All right, ecological intensification is what we call decreasing agricultural dependence on man-made products like fertilizers and pesticides and instead, utilizing natural means to increase yields. Natural ways of increasing yields include exploring the relationship between various organisms such as the livestock on the farm, the crops grown, and all the microbes that are present in the environment. The main idea here is to promote biodiversity while maintaining production and profit levels. Some examples of ecological intensification include cover-up cropping or planting flower-rich habitats along the edges of the fields. Both of these practices increase the population of nitrogen nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and help reduce crop pests. As a result, we get better soil fertility as well as increased crop yields. So what do long-term studies say about ecological intensification? There's been plenty of research on ecological intensification, and while it's proven how effective the innovative approach to agriculture is, there have been certain shortcomings. These researchers were conducted over a short time interval, so we're unable to estimate the long-term benefits of ecological intensification. But in a new study, scientists experimented what the long-term effects on this method could be. Researchers conducted around 30 long-term experiments all over Europe and Africa, and the results were quite fascinating. They showed how farmers can decrease their usage of fertilizers by switching to various methods of ecological intensification. By doing so, they'll be able to have the same number of crop yields as they did when they used fertilizers. And then the experiments on various ecological practices and the use of fertilizers. We already know the aim of ecological intensification is to substitute fertilizers with natural resources. In our next study, the researchers observed various ecological practices. First one was crop diversification, which basically included planting different crops close to each other. The second practice was using fertility crops instead of staple food crops. And finally, the third one was the management of organic matter. This includes compost and manure for the purpose of fertilization of crops. What they did was increase the use of these three ecological practices while decreasing the use of nitrogen-based fertilizers. We're aware that nitrogen is extremely important for crop growth, but at the same time, it bears incredible side effects, the main one being soil and air pollution as we mentioned before. Up next, here's what was concluded through these different experiments. Now let's see what results the researchers obtained by implementing the ecological practices we just talked about now. Whenever these practices are added to any farming system, there was an observed increase in crop yields. All three ecological practices produced some incredible benefits as long as the use of nitrogen-based fertilizer was kept to a minimum. What's more, they didn't see any benefits when they simply used the fertilizer. This proves that we can have a good crop yield if we switch to using natural resources in agriculture. The fact is, those three practices in the fertilizer all serve the same purpose, providing nitrogen to crops. If the crops can grow in a sustainable way, then we should definitely opt for the method that's not harming the environment. Lastly, what's the overall effect of the ecological intensification? And now let's discuss the overall effect of this sustainable agricultural method. With growing concerns about climate change, it's absolutely necessary for us to switch to sustainable yet effective 
effective farming techniques. From this research, we've seen how fruitful ecological intensification is. It improves crop yields, ensures global food security while minimizing the negative impacts of agriculture on the environment. There's a growing need to not overload our ecosystems with nitrogen pollution, and by switching to these tried and tested ecological practices, we can achieve our environmental goals. It's important to note that we don't have to completely cut down fertilizer use on our farms, we just need to decrease the excessive amount that's used, and that way we'll be more sustainable in our agricultural practices. Now, in other related ecology news, first up, dentistry meets ecology, the latest technology for studying coral. Before, whenever scientists had their time to measure coral size and growth, they had to use techniques that would consume a lot of time. What's more, the entire procedure would require too much effort. But now, Dr. Kate Quigley, a senior research scientist at the Mindaroo Foundation, has come up with a technique that's going to reduce coral surveying time by an incredible 99%. And the best part, she was inspired by a trip to her dentist. None of us ever imagined that coral and teeth could possess such interesting similarities. They're both very small in size and both contain calcium as well. That's not all. To study the two, you need to use equipment that doesn't rust on a wet surface. Old methods often damage the coral and scientists were always in search of a tool that would help them study these small live animals without causing them any harm. Well, thanks to a regular dental checkup, scientists are now exploring how they can use the dental scanner iTero Element 5D Flex to measure juvenile corals. Using these dental scanners, scientists were able to build a 3D model of the coral in almost three minutes, while before this it took them more than four hours. That's just super awesome in our opinion. Next up, flowering plants are much older than we thought. We discover something new every day, and today we learn that some of Earth's oldest plants were here on the planet even way before the dinosaurs. We're talking about the buckthorn family of plants. They're widespread plants found all over the continents. Scientists use molecular clock techniques on these plants to calculate how long the buckthorn family has populated the earth? Turns out, they've been here for more than 250 million years. Dr. Tian Huahi, a molecular geneticist working at Murdoch University, together with his team calculated the age of these plants by comparing the DNA of the living plants from this family with the rate at which the DNA had changed over the past 120 million years ago. Before this, scientists thought these flowering plants were around 20 to 100 million years old. Looks like that's no longer true. Another Another interesting detail scientists have stumbled across while researching the history of the plants is that the buckthorn family of plants possesses fire-related traits. Basically, that means the environment these plants evolved in was regularly subject to fires, which kind of explains why the seeds of the buckthorn plants are so hard and need fire to begin germinating. Well, that's definitely something cool. Who would have thought some plants would need fire to grow? And finally, bacteria in subarctic caves are under threat due to climate change. Numerous studies have demonstrated that bacteria living inside subarctic caves can be pretty beneficial in the field of medicine. But with recent changes in our climate, we're witnessing how vulnerable this bacterial ecosystem is to these changes. A study conducted by Anna Sofia Rebuliera, a researcher from the University of Lisbon, explained how disastrous the effects of climate change are for microbial environments found inside caves. With increased global warming, we're seeing the ice in subarctic regions melt at alarming rates. This, in turn, has a negative impact on the bacterial communities found inside these caves. Scientists haven't even had a proper opportunity to explore the many benefits of these bacterial species and how they might help us overcome the nagging problem of antibiotic resistance. And with the current situation, it seems like we might lose this incredible biodiversity before we ever find out what kind of benefits they could bring us. That's a wrap for this video. Want to hear more news related to ecology? Let us know in the comments below. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. See you in the next one.